السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته uh, Brothers and sisters, friends and colleagues everywhere and anywhere Yesterday I talked about the Sudan floods and the climate change in Arabic Today I'm repeating it again into English language to benefit the people who are not Arabic speaking Let me start to thank my colleague who prepared this speech or this lecture uh, which you can see them in the following uh, slide Ali Shawa of course he's the one who's looking about the media production Aliyu is originally Kenyan but he is a disaster risk reduction and climate change expert and currently working with Islamic default wide in Somalia as a country director and Abdaliz Khater is originally Sudanese and is a humanitarian and development expert worker. Thank the three uh, brothers who helped me in preparing this presentation to you. Next, please. I will divide my presentation today into five, five parts. First, we'll talk about the climate change. Second, we'll talk about global adversive corruption affecting global uh, countries, countries all over the place. Thirdly, we'll talk about Sudan floods. Fourthly, we'll talk about the different standards in dealing with different disasters, especially natural or man-made disasters. Number five is suggested solution to go forward. Let us talk about climate change and people might say, what is the relationship between the flood in Sudan and the climate change. Definitely, there's a very, very strong relationship between all these flash floods and the climate change. The increasing temperature and the pollution as well as the rising of sea level. Let us talk about what do we mean by greenhouse gas. Greenhouse gases from human activities are the most significant driver of observed climate change. Greenhouse gases that we produce through our industries, through our, through un, through our unfriendly and climate unfriendly industry. Characterized by the emission of the major greenhouse gases resulting from human activities industries, different industries, cars, uh, factories, uh, planes, and all these sort of things. The concentration of these gases in the atmosphere will be around the whole atmosphere. Okay? And how emissions and concentration have changed over time resulting to what we know now, greenhouse effect greenhouse gases, greenhouse effect, unfriendly industry and unfriendly use of the energy and uh, uh, we are having nowadays. Global greenhouse emission and climate change. This is the relationship. Don't say that there is no relation between what's happening in Sudan and the climate change or the greenhouse emission, the, the greenhouse gas emission. Global annual greenhouse gas emissions have grown from 0.929 in the 1991 to about 40% in 2012 and more and more and more to come later on and this will impact more on our climate. Negative impact. Global carbon dioxide emission from the fossil fuels are on track to again climb to a record by a 19, 2019, according to a new report from the Global Carbon Project, putting the world, putting the whole world at what? At risk. At risk, at a major risk, great risk, risk of a catastrophic climate change due to this heat trapping gas, due to this heat trapping gases, which you called it carbon dioxide. Average per capita emission of greenhouse gas is about 4.8 tons per capita. 
of fossil fuel, carbon dioxide per person last year. This was 2019. But this was on the rise in certain parts of the world and not in the other parts. He found that this, this per capita in Australia was 16.9 tons per capita per person, in China 7 tons per capita or per person, in European Union 6.7 per capita per person, but in the United States of America it is 16.6 tons per capita. So here we look at the impact, the impact of the unfriendly industry of the industrial states such as China and the United States of America. Next, please. Global carbon emission, this is coming, yani, shocking news for us. We all know about it. But those industrial countries refuse to be a part of the climate conference. Of the climate conference. Which was withdrawn from uh, COP25, uh, unfortunately, especially in the United States of America. If we look at this drawing, you find that 25% of the global carbon emission 2019 coming from one country called China. One country called China. 16% coming from another country called the United States of America. So between China and the Far East, and USA in the far west, 45% of global carbon emission is coming out of their industry. Very, very, very unfriendly industry which is affecting the globe. If we add to them uh, India, uh, Russia, and Japan, it will rise up to 61%. Next, please. Here we call, look about the carbon dioxide emission per capita. You find this another chart. It is in Australia 18.6 ton, ton uh, per capita. In the United States of America 18, Canada 16.3, and so and so and so and so. So here our problem is not with the poor country, not with the underdeveloped country who are polluting and changing the climate negatively, but with the industrial, civilized, advanced, developed countries. Next, please. Where these gas go? It being absorbed by the ocean. If we look at this yellow uh, draw, the, the yellow chart on, on the top, it was less than nearly or 10%, 10, uh, in between 1960 to 1969, but it grew up to nearly 40% by 2018. And the absorption in the ocean, which lead to increase the temperature of the ocean, as well as the rising of ocean and sea level, went out from minus 10 to about nearly 25 plus in by the 2018. So the gas goes to, to be sinking in the ocean and in the seas. That's why we have temperature rise and that's why we have sea level rise. Because of the uh, uh, increased emission of carbon dioxide from the industrial states. We talk in Sudan about, in, in Sudan about the flooding. So what is, what, what, what is that to do with locusts? With the temperature rise, and with the sea level and the rise, this will facilitate the cycle of growth and regeneration and migration of locusts between these areas. Talk of East Africa, China, and uh, Middle East, as well as others. And this, on top of the flood in Sudan, if the locust invades Sudan, it eats all the greenery and it leads to what we call it uh, in food insecurity in the area it's affected by the locusts. Next, please. Locust impact on food security. Yes, definitely there's an impact. The plague of locusts is spreading across East Africa region. By the way, this climate change and the flash floods is not only in East Africa, it's West Africa as well. It's in Afghanistan, it's in Pakistan and different countries. 
the plague of locusts is, is spreading across the East African region, threatening the food supply of tens of millions, for tens of millions. The scale of the locust outbreak, which now affects seven countries in East Africa, including Kenya, Somalia, Ethiopia, Eritrea, Uganda, South Sudan, and Tanzania. Seven countries. Seven countries. Seven countries. Experts say it may be a threat of things to come or something like a, a, a flash or things to come as rising sea surface and surface. The most important thing at rising sea surface the sea surface and temperature because of the emission of the carbon dioxide. Supercharged storms and the climate change tips the scales in favor of circulation pattern like one the one that set the stage for this years of transoceanic disaster. So so increased temperature, rising sea level, humidity will help the grow uh, the, the reproduction and migration of the locusts. Locusts and food security or food insecurity by June, uh, the fears of desert locusts in, in the desert, in, in Sub-Saharan desert, will have increased their number 400 fold compared to February 2020, triggering widespread devastation of crops to crops and pastures in a region that is already extremely vulnerable of farming. So this increased number of 400 fold is another catastrophe will is affecting East Africa and we hope it does not go to Sudan as well. Over 13 million people in Djibouti, Eritrea, Ethiopia, Kenya, and Somalia experiencing what? Severe acute food insecurity. Say them again, Djibouti, Eritrea, Ethiopia, Kenya, and Somalia. Severe acute food insecurity, 13 million, according to FAO, Food and Agriculture Organization. While another 20 million, but 33 million, are on the brink of having food insecurity in this region. Next, please. What is the relationship between COVID and climate change and carbon dioxide emission level? Look at the image, the light image, which is between the 1st and the 20th of January 2020, before China closed the factories in this area. You found this yellow and brown area, which is the uh, polluted area because of uh, the greenhouse gases, because of the carbon dioxide coming out from such factors. If we look at the other image, which is from 10th February to 25th February, the same year, you find there is no, same area, there is no yellow or brown area. So thank you COVID, thank you Corona of stopping this in the month of February and March. This was a satellite image taken during China three month lockdown. Yes, please. I'm still talking about climate change because this is the key problem for having these flash floods every now and then. Next, please. This is a flash flood in a place called Bedouin in Somalia, and the relief workers are working amongst people try to get uh, their job done properly. Okay? Next, please. Illustration of the link between climate change and natural disaster. There is a strong link between climate change and natural disaster. January and February 2020 had also had above average rain, possibly related to persistent warm water in the Western Indian Ocean. Indian Ocean. Warm water. Okay? Climate change is expected to have increased 
the probability of these events so the rapid lake level rise both in Kenya and Ethiopia. It led to the rapid lake level rising in Kenya and Ethiopia. In March to May 2020, we have seen further heavy rainfall, pushing up lake levels to a near record breaking level. So even then like we talked about the sea level, we talked about the ocean level, so the warming of the water and this as well as the lake level in Ethiopia and in uh, Kenya. The, this event illustrates how natural disasters, sometimes enhanced by climate change, they say sometimes, I say most of the time, or even interconnected, interconnected all the time with climate change. The exceptional rain of 2019-2020 has led to flooding directly from the rainfall as well as from rivers and the lake and has been linked to disease outbreaks. So flooding because of climate change, then outbreak of diseases affecting us later on. Climate change and food insecurity. Yes, we mentioned before the locust impact on food insecurity and the water covering the land, the agricultural land. Weather has affected crop growth and food prices has contributed to the locust outbreak. Yani food insecurity will come from the water affecting the growth of crops as well as the arrival of the migrant millions and tens of millions of locusts to this area. People in the region are suffering in this area, especially in West East Africa, are suffering the impacts of this event as well as COVID-19. The locust, the flooding and COVID-19 at the same time. In quick succession, reducing the ability to cope with the three and the acute food insecurity is growing. Acute, 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 acute food insecurity is growing. Uh, climate change and livelihood. It affects livelihood. These images are from Sudan. In 2019, heavy rain continued to fall, causing flash flooding in 16 out of 18 states inside Sudan killing or maybe 78 people, displacing for 346,300 people, and, uh, and more than 41,000 houses have been destroyed and almost 28,000 demolished. 69,000 houses partially or totally destroyed. This is in 2019, Sudan. Sustained so extreme rains, coming, coming down, coming down, coming down, coming down have resulted in floods and landslide, landslide covering the land, slide across Kenya and Uganda. You see, brothers and sisters, we talk about cross-country landslide of water covering the land. Kenya is not a small town, it's not a village, it's not a street, it's not an area, it is country, Kenya and Uganda. Since mid 2019 to 2020. Additional to flooding in Southeast Ethiopia and Somalia, both during the short trains of late 2019 and 2020. Long rain, long rain, longer period of rain that used to be before. Season resulting in displacing 4,000 households, yeah, about 20, 25, 30,000 people. By September 2020, as we are in now, in Sudan, the number of victims become as follows. More than 100 people died. More than, approximately more than 500,000 uh, people become displaced. And nearly 100,000 houses 
and the homes partially or totally destroyed. This is talking about between the last two years, 2019 and 2020. In conclusion to the climate change, I thank my brothers, Aliyu, as well as uh, Abdaziz. In conclusion, as the richer nations continue to produce and emit large tons of greenhouse gas emission, the climate-induced disaster will continue to be felt across, across the globe. It's because of those arrogant, stubborn, so-called strong, superpower, industrial states. They don't listen to people and they pollute the planet. And they produce a climate unfriendly industry. Inhuman. 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 I will say it again. As the richer nations continue to produce and emit large tons of greenhouse gas emissions, the climate induced disasters will continue to be felt across the globe. You remember what happened in tsunami in uh, uh, 2005? Tsunami. Tsunami. You know what happened? Tsunami. The wave hit Banda Aceh in the far east in Indonesia. But it came across to reach Somalia and Maldives in a few days. People thought at that time it is, oh my God, maybe a nuclear bomb or a nuclear test or whatever it is. It is climate change. Keep disputing and keep don't believe that climate change is polluting. It's because of the pollution, it's because of the industrialist states. East African countries will continue to face multi-hazards and multi-disasters such as perennial flash flooding, drought, locust invasion, and diseases. Millions will continue to suffer from lack of food, basic shelter, and be exposed to preventable diseases such as cholera and malaria. It's time, it's time to all of you, to all of us, to call on global community to be accountable. For God's sake, be accountable for the planet. As their actions to emit greenhouse gases is misery, is a misery for others in the South. They don't care. Even they don't join the climate conference. Through World Economic Forum and other like-minded organizations, outreach and sensitization will continue to be conducted until bigger nations or stronger nations or industrial nations through a four alike of COP25 and others make resolution to climate justice. Climate justice. We all live together on this planet. We all have to preserve and protect the climate. These are some of the references uh, for this reading, if you would like to use it. Next, please. The second point in my discussion with you today is global administrative corruption. Look at this global map. The more green means that the country is putting anti or top anti-corruption policy. The more to the brown means there is no anti-corruption policy and the country unfortunately is corrupt. From the dark green into the dark brown. And you can see the different countries on the map which give you uh, these images and this according to Wikipedia as well as the, uh, what do you call it, the Transparency International as well. Next please. This is the Middle East map, talking about the ranking of the countries in the Middle East uh, from the bottom up. The lowest at the bottom is Somalia, then Syria, then Yemen, then Sudan, then Libya, then Iraq, Comoros Island, Mauritania, Lebanon, Djibouti, Egypt, Algeria, Kuwait, Morocco, Bahrain, Tunisia, Jordan, Oman, Saudi Arabia, Qatar, Emirates. Sudan, 19, Sudan is uh, 173 from the bottom. Uh, Lebanon, 137. 
يعني both countries which affected over the last two months by severe corruption in both countries as well as others and this is actually we managed to cut this from the table on my right hand side could be your left hand side is the top or the best 20 countries in the world is fighting corruption and on the other side is the worst 20 countries in the world is fighting corruption we fight on the on, on my right hand side which is your left hand side or whatever you call it the best country is new zealand goes new zealand denmark finland sweden singapore norway netherlands australia Then even if we look at actually a country like, uh, where is Great Britain? Great Britain, I think it is uh, number 18, or, or number uh, 18, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, yeah, uh, 18. But when we look at the other side, which is the worst 20 countries on the corruption index, we find the bottom, the most, the lowest one is Somalia. Or out of these 20 countries, 10 of them are from the Arab world or from the Muslim world, which includes Somalia, Afghanistan, Uzbekistan, Turkmenistan, Sudan, Iraq, uh, Libya, Chad, Yemen, Kyrgyzstan. 10 out of 20, the bottom one, which include, which actually reflects highest level of corruption. Why I'm talking about corruption? Because if we have corrupt government, corrupt system, of course we'll allow industrial states and big multinational companies to corrupt our land, to corrupt our climate. And this is the relationship between corruption and climate change and those flash flooding, desertification, and, 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 and. Sudan floods. Sudan is experiencing an unprecedented humanitarian disaster due to the high level of annual flooding. Annual, it becomes a habit. Like the sun comes from the east, set in the west, now it's annual flooding of the Nile River since the end of July. And the authorities declared the state of emergency for three months. And Sudan is still plagued by severe, what? Have other problem, economic problem and health problem as well. Sudan was declared a disaster area after 17 out of 18 states been affected by the flood. And the rise of the water in the river actually grew up to 17.64 per uh, meter. And the water level had risen by 17.64 meters. If you can look at the right 17 states of Sudan or wilayat of Sudan, Khartoum, uh, North Darfur, Sinar, West Darfur, uh, Kasala, Gadarif, Al Jazeera, East Darfur, North Kordofan, Red Sea, South Darfur, River Nile, Northern State, White Nile, Blue Nile, South Kordofan. All this affected, as you can see them. Heavy rains and the floods in most parts of Sudan caused what? series of devastation including damage to homes infrastructure agricultural land and other means of livelihood whereas more than 500 kilometers square kilometer 500 square kilometer covered by the water itself this is sudan flood map organized by uh, UN OCHA, United Nations Office of Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs. It said that affected population in Sudan, as it came to me uh, today, 557,130, not only 500,000, I've been mentioned a few days ago, 557,130 people are affected by the flood. 56,302 houses damaged and 55,124 houses destroyed. Yeah, in between. 111,000 houses are either damaged or destroyed totally. And these are the states, as I mentioned before. 500, 
and fifty seven thousand people are affected and hundred and eleven hundred twelve thousand houses damaged and destroyed. Next please. These are the scenes of our brothers and sisters in Sudan. Actually, these four people are not just pushing their mother or their sister or their auntie in a, in a picnic, in a river. This looks like a banyu or, or a basin or a sink in, in washing in, 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 uh, uh, in, in the bathroom. And those people sitting on the, on, on the bed are not just posing for photographs. And you can see people are really suffering. Imagine yourself are having this situation and living inside this situation to understand the feeling and the agony of those people. Next, please. I said three points have discussed the climate change, global and corruption, corruption, the flood Sudan, and the standards of for dealing with different disasters. As I mentioned before, we have two disasters. The explosion in Beirut port, then which, which led to 300, more than 350,000 people displaced, maybe 5,000 injured, uh, maybe a few hundred people died, okay? And Beirut is still suffering and needs help. And nowadays, 557,000 Sudanese are affected 111,000 partially demolished or partially destroyed or damaged or totally destroyed and 100 people died. I thank Mr. Macron who stood up and traveled the way, his way to go twice to Lebanon. I'm not talking about political background or political interest. Thank you, Mr. Macron. Thank you for organizing even I maintain the response to conference or donor conference, which is more than $300 million in one day. But I have not seen ministers, prime ministers, kings or queens or big officials to travel to Sudan. Pity and shame on me. Even I was observing the movement of young volunteers, whom I used to know them from the West, going to Beirut. Yes, Beirut needs help. But Sudan also needs help. Beirut needs help and need a lot of help, but Sudan as well needs help. But Africa needs help. We don't have to have double standard in humanitarian disasters. When we go to one area and we ignore the other area, humanitarian standards should be the same, should be applied for everyone, anyone, regardless of color, regardless of background, regardless of religion, regarding of race, regardless of race. Next, please. Look at here. Sudan pulled the fund dashboard by UNHCR. UNHCR is, is requesting $150 million. They only got $54 million, which is 35% of what they want to raise, okay? Fine, thank you, you are not sure. But President Macron conference, donor conference, raised 253 million euro, which is 300 million dollar. Five and a half times as much as the United Nations trying hard to raise fund for the 557 affected people in Sudan. Ah. Why? Why only 50 million for Sudan? I need 300 million, 400 million for, for, for Sudan, and even for Beirut as well, and to be the same, to be treated the same. All right, next please. Solution. This is the, my final stop. I talked about the problems and the treating different problem differently, corruption and relationship to climate change, climate change and the relationship to uh, industrial countries and so on. The short term solution, then long term solution. Short term solution, this is for the young people. I'm just talking to the young people. I want you to widely spread the news of Sudan floods 
and its impact on the affected population, more than 550,000 people is still underwater. You, what you call yourself, influencers or activists on the social media, please, 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 you can outreach millions of people faster and wider than the state media or the traditional media. Number two, activating the means of collecting donations through online, online donation in Europe, in America, in different parts of the world. Number three, sending urgent relief items like tents, like blankets, like medicine, like food, like clothes, all these kind of things, all these kind of things. Like porta cabin sometimes if you have if you have them uh, ready to be shipped as well. Number four, urging. Here, here is very, very. From the depths of every cell in my body and my heart, urging donor governments, especially the Arab donor governments, to facilitate and speed the fund transfer to those people in need in Sudan. With the more delay, that means that we're losing more life or more people will become affected by diseases. Unfortunately, I am bleeding from my heart for such countries, such governments who are putting people, stopping, 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 stopping fund transfer to people who are dying under the banner of counter extremism, counter radicalism, counter, 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 and those humanitarian workers globally, whether Muslims or non Muslims, are offering their life to save the lives of others. For God's sake, such government speed up the process of transfer and help the dying people or the sick people. Another appeal urging the Organization of Islamic Cooperation, the League of Arab States, Africa Union, to play their role, their historic role. Actually, I'm not talking about political, economical, providing and helping and providing relief materials to the affected people in Sudan. Even, even to Beirut as well. I have no problem. No problem, even to West Africa, even to East Africa, if anywhere. Encouraging Sudanese young people to engage in volunteering in order to accommodate and assist the affected population at the moment. Next, please. Next. Facilitating volunteers and non-government organizations to access the affected area. Because sometimes the government security forces prevent uh, or does not allow access to this area. Coordinating the efforts between local organizations operating on the ground. And we don't have to repeat what others are doing. Coordinating between United Nations uh, offices and organizations and international and government organizations operating in Sudan. Finding out the scale of the affected area and population, affected area and population caused by the floods. As the as United Nations uh, report was mentioning that 557,000 uh, people affected, uh, nearly 111, 12,000 houses are demolished or destroyed, and 100 plus people died. Then drawing the roadmap for what? For a certain in a state of emergency. For the state of emergency, which goes, goes between six months to one year. You know what to tell you, brothers and sisters and colleagues and friends? Soon, the water stopped flooding. The river stopped flooding. We will be affected by maybe the plague of Lucas, malaria, mosquito, uh, waterborne diseases, and others. And you don't have facilities to deal with them, especially if you have more than 550,000 people are affected up to now, and especially when we have more than 111,000 houses either damaged or destroyed. 
tired, tired, tired. Drawing a road map for the relief or the emergency phase, which can go to up to one year, organizing international donor conference for Sudan, as it's been organized by President Macron for Beirut before. Next. And this is, uh, I repeat it again, this is a pooled fund dashboard which uh, requested by Un United Nations OCHA. You know what? They want $150 million. They only got $54 million and they are short of $100 million. One was President Macron, uh, thank him, raised $300 million in one day. Here was the effort of United Nations who only managed to raise $54 million. Next. Please. No, no, no. This one. Here, on the, on, on the left hand side, my left, which could be your right, uh, this is actually the, 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 the gender or the people affected, 24% uh, boys, young men, 24% uh, young uh, men and 27% women and 26% girls. So 53% are women and girls and 48% are men. This is the affected population. If we go to the needs that actually we need money for health program, for protection, for water and sanitation, for nutrition, for education, for uh, food security, for emergency uh, shelter, we only have يعني, 2.7 million for health. يعني, and water sanitation, 1.3 million. Let us, let's actually, to be very frank, if I take you to the other side of the uh, images here in front of me, country number one who contributed 33%, 33.5% of the fund to United Nations is, you know, is United Kingdom, followed by Germany, 6%, followed by Sweden, 5.6%, followed by Netherlands, 4.3%, followed by uh, Ireland, 3.2%, followed by Denmark, 2.2%, followed by Norway, 2.1%, followed by Canada, 1.7%, followed by Switzerland, 1.1%, followed by Italy, 0.6%, and followed by Korea, I think this should be South Korea, 0.3%. I have not seen, this actually, uh, you are not sure, statistics. I have not seen Arab or Muslim countries contributing to them. Maybe they have contributed, but they are not um, a, a informing United Nations. Next, please. Uh, this was supposed for the short-term solution. Longer-term solution, we have to draw and define the roadmap for the reconstruction of the affected infrastructure and building the damaged houses or uh, buildings, whether government building or houses. Coordinating the effort between the Sudanese local organization operating on the ground. I'm talking about coordination and communication and networking extremely important at the time of disasters. Whether it's a man-made disaster or it is actually natural disaster. Coordinating the effort between local Sudanese organization, international organization, and government institution. Coordination, coordination, coordination. Facilitating the entry of what? Of reconstruction building materials. We need, we might not have it in the country. But we need the government to facilitate this. Empowering the local Sudanese civil society organization and strategically investing and in building their, their human resource capacities and capabilities. Capacities and capabilities. Investing in building Sudanese infrastructure, infrastructure to prevent such disasters from happening again. Investing in building stronger civil service, civil service sector, sector, not military only, not security only, not intelligence only, civil, civil, civil service sector. We only invest in security, we only invest in military and intelligence. Where are the rest of social services and civil services to be delivered to the people? Investing in building 
stronger civil service sectors such as health, education, agriculture, industry, crafts, economy, transportation, etc., etc., water, sanitation, all these kind of things. Next, please. Number eight, fighting corruption. As I mentioned, ranking of Sudan is at the bottom of the table is number 173 out of 180 or 82. <sighs> this could be if we don't fight corruption, not only in Sudan, everywhere. Everywhere. Even so-called rich countries are number 50 or 60 or 70 or 100 or 140 or 120. If we do not fight corruption in, can, in the big country, big huge country like Sudan and others, this might affect national unity of the country. The more corruption we have, the less we have national community. Fighting the negative impacts of desertification, drought, climate change affecting the universe by building what? Not bridges, building alliances. Alliances with other countries and the international institution. We have to build alliance to stop those industrial countries from polluting the planet, from affecting the life of every living being on the planet, from destroying the resources of the planet, and from having more disasters. Because the greed of such industrialists is killing the, 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 the millions of other people on the planet. Widening the civil liberty space for civil side sector and organization in Sudan, making new strategic agriculture and livestock policies to preserve these sectors, investing in building community markets and craft industry to create more jobs or job opportunity for young people, as well as investing in supporting young people, new initiative, and recognizing their entrepreneurial quality of work. Invest in young people. That means that you invest in the current, present time, and in the future. More, the reward from such investment will be more rewarding than investing in oil, gas, and others and even what you call it tourism and uh, export and import because human resources is the most precious and most valuable and most uh, what you call it, a country it's nothing more precious than a human being on this planet Developing a new strategy on how to utilize, save, and store the Nile River and rainfall water through building canals, lakes, reservoirs, water dams, uh, deep wells, bridges, what they call it, uh, tunnels, and all these kind of things. All the projects of uh, saving and uh, consuming, better consuming better consumption of water. Agreeing with the Nile Basin countries, which about 11 of them, I'll show them the map later on, on a common strategy of using the Nile River water to prevent any member country from abusing its power or abusing the rights of other member countries. Not because I am a country where I am from the source of the Nile, so I control the water. Nile water is a God given to the 11, the 11, the 11 Nile Basin country residing at the banks of the River Nile. Reviewing export and import policies and to facilitate the export of Sudanese product to the outside world. These are actually suggested long term and short term solutions. Next, please. And this, as I said, if we go to, to, to the river Nile, there's two Niles. One called White Nile, originating from, so from uh, Uganda, and the other called Blue Nile, originating from Ethiopia. Okay? The one from Ethiopia is the big one, which most of the water is coming from this one. 
And these are the country which make the Nile Basin countries around the river. Uh, even Democratic Republic of Congo, Ethiopia, Uganda, Eritrea, Kenya, Rwanda, Burundi, Tanzania, Sudan, Egypt, and South Sudan. Those countries have to sit down and make a strategy on how, how collectively we should utilize the water of the River Nile, which is the Blue Nile, and the White Nile, which will come to Khartoum, uh, they meet together in the middle in Khartoum and Amudurman and make the River Nile that goes up to the north to Egypt. Next, please. I take this opportunity to thank, if you can bring me the, the images of my colleagues at the very beginning, please. Because I have to recognize them, it's not myself. It is uh, all the credit should go to them. No, uh, no, 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 no. Next, uh, you, uh, Ali, Shawa, yeah, and Chief. The beauty, the beautiful thing is, one from Turkey as a Syrian, one from Kenya, Somalia as an African, and one from Sudan, Africa. Three people are helping me to disseminate this valuable information to you. Thank you. Abdulaziz, thank you, Aliyu, thank you, Ali, and thank you all for listening to me today. And God bless you, may Allah bless you, wherever you are, whenever you are, to make your life easy and safe. But my last message fight the climate change, stop the climate change, help people to stand to have a climate justice, climate justice, climate justice. Assalamu alaikum wa